Hey everyone, this is Mike with Play More Games, and today we are going to take a look at Death in the Trenches. So this is um, this is the game all set up. So this is just going to be a short overview of the turn one setup. Maybe talk a little bit about the game um, before I actually start playing it here. So we are all set up, and as you can see, um, let me pull back a little. It is a table hog. Uh, so even at 22 by 34, uh, you and I'll zoom in later, you have the bulk of the action on the western front here. You have the Balkans, which, as the famous quote goes, produce more history than they can consume. And uh, you have the very lonely German, uh, I believe historically this was the 8th Army at Konigsberg, surrounded by Russians. Uh... Yeah, uh, and over in the Near East, you have uh, the Ottoman Empire, um, which I think they use Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Turkey, Turkish. Um, you have, of course, Armenians represented as well. Uh, you have the territory... Uh, here in the Persian Gulf. I forget which invasion this was, but it's one of the first cards you can play in Pursuit of Glory. And setting this game up made me want to get out Pursuit of Glory. Um, Pursuit of Glory is a game that I love a lot, and I think it exceeds the original Paths of Glory. Um, but I suck at it. Um, I'm pretty bad. I've never won. Uh, so here we have the turn track, and let's zoom in and get a close look. So there's some simple information here. Um, the shadings mean a certain thing. I think it's uh, who goes first. Most of the game it's uh, the central powers, but uh, some key points is the Entente powers. Uh, any special rules? Um, weather is not a huge factor in this game, partly because of the scale, and as the designer notes, um, most offensive operations were equally disastrous in spring weather, and in winter weather. Uh, we have a couple boxes for beachheads down here. We have an air and naval supremacy chart here. Naval supremacy, we have naval units, like for example, here's a French naval, uh, here's a French naval unit, here's a Turkish naval unit, and they can kind of move around during the event phase. The naval aspect is very abstracted. Uh, air is determined by random events, um, here's the Minor Forces Reserve box. Here is a huge out of play. And so they're like spelling, you can see the Americans bringing up the pack there. Um, these units only enter the game by special event. So there's a lot of minor powers um, um, and special units. So um, let me see, I can see from here Brazilian units, Chinese units, uh, Czech Legion, uh, of course the Reds. Um, Irish Home Rule, Irish Army, uh, the Sud Army, and on and on and on and on. Uh, over here, we have the colonial map. So, the colonial map, you can tell the German colonial possessions because they have the gray markers. Uh, most of them are Staustruppen, which are kind of like light uh, fighters. Um, there's only a couple of normal infantry units. Uh, here and here. Uh, we have some of our colonial forces here, uh, more colonial units here, um, we have India represented here. Uh, here we have the battle board and um, I will come back and talk about that in a minute. Uh, here we have a markers track and we have available units that are able to be built in these three boxes here. We have tons of trackers here. Each army has an intrinsic value. Let's just pull one here. Uh, this one has a strength of 3 and a fortitude of 12. When you're in combat, you're using both values simultaneously. But armies can have a certain amount of divisions attached to it, and basically each division acts as a 1-1. One, one. So, you have this army. This is the 14th army, right? And if it's assigned 10 divisions, 
it would have a strength of 1322. And each side has a division limit, so Germans can attach 25 divisions. And um, you can use them to modify your strength, and then you can use them to take losses. So there's a Central Powers one, and you can see that a lot of the Turkish units have very small divisional attachments, while the Austrians and the Germans have much larger amounts of divisions attached. You also track the reserves here, because you can kind of shuffle divisions to and from in between your armies, um, and you get extra divisions each turn uh, to help support your offensives. So here's the Central Powers one. And over here is the Allied Power one. You can see quite a few British and French start in the boxes here. We have these allocation markers here. Uh, more on those in a second. We have Fort Destroyed markers here. We have some generic markers that don't come into play just yet. Mostly these are done by event. Uh, we can see the Mad Legend himself, Lenin. So, uh, Franz Joseph, rest in peace. Uh, let's see. Do we have any other good ones here? Um, okay, so then each side has these special event trackers, and each allocation marker is one, uh, one instance of whatever it is that you can use. So let's just take a look. This one here is covered up, but it's Krupp's, it's Krupp, Krupp Works, the German artillery makers, and each one of those you expend in 1914, you get to add 20 firepower to an attack. So if we come back over here, and we say that we have one of these armies here, um, the 8th has 20 divisions attached, and, um, and we would go over here and find the 8th. It's somewhere in that stack. I don't want to mess it up. So let's say it's like 312, like some of the others. So it would be 2332. And if we've spent one of those Krupp's guns markers in 1914, now it's uh, 4332. Um, so basically, how combat works is you have a firepower value, all right? And that firepower value, let's take a look at the battle chart here. That firepower value is the kind of value that you're looking to dice against. So it's kind of neat in that you want to get as close as possible without going over. If you go over, you do zero hits. So you can roll as many dice as you want, but you have to be careful. So let's say our modified firepower value is 32. We decide to roll eight dice, and let's say that we get an average result of three per dice, um, eight, 16, 24. Let's say we do 24 hits, all right? So then we would come to this chart. I wasn't able to really describe this until I read the rules, and let's say it was Russia, right? So then basically we, we convert those eight dice based on this. So any fours would get added to it. So we have 32, and let's say that we had two fours, now we have 34 hits. Um, then we have effects, like, all right, if this combat's in a swamp, any ones that I rolled are miss. Or if it's in rough, it backfires. Ones in swamp miss, uh, backfires in rough. Bloodbath and mountain, trench effect. So you can see that Russia is set up a bit differently than, let's say, Germany which has a one backfires in rough, two misses in swap, two bloodbath in mountain, three trench effects, six always hits. So very similar, but things are kind of moved around. Um, fours and fives have no additional effect. Uh, I, was sitting, I was sitting here looking at this, trying to figure out like which one is the best one, and uh, I don't know, but like if you look at France, um, they don't have any like always hits on there, right? Uh, U.S. doesn't have any always hits. Austria-Hungary does, however. But they also have a certain number of backfires. Um, one, three, four, Ottoman Turkey. No always hits. Russia has no always hits. So, it's an interesting way of showing 
how each nation has different capabilities and um, of course each side has different, different uh, replacement rates as well. Alright, uh, so we're starting to get a little long-winded here so I just want to show the front here now that I've gone and meticulously set this up. So here we are, we are set up to uh, march. Uh, you can see these flipped units here, the ones with the, the lines are like uh, plan 17 uh, units, but we have this nice stack here ready to push to Paris, which is one, two, three, four hexes away. Which is really not that far when you when you think about it. But if we look at the Eastern Front, all we have is the Lonely Eighth Army, and they're in a position where they can get outmaneuvered. We have Russians in Poland, right? So we could go dun 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 the Danzig, and now they're in trouble. So what do we do? Good question. I don't know what we do. We're gonna have to find out. Um, there's a lot more that goes into the game. Um, yeah, minor powers, like for example, the Bavarians here um, are represented as a minor power unit. They have special stacking rules. We have uh, neutral powers. Italy starts neutral, of course. Greece starts neutral. Uh, Bulgaria, Romania starts neutral. All that kind of goes um, into... Uh, I mean, it depends on how it plays out. Uh, you have an option to arrest uh, Putnik um, and not let him take command of Serbia, but that has consequences as well. We have... Um, Tsar Nicholas, who's convalescing in uh, the Winter Palace. Of course, we have the Russian Revolution modeled in this game. Whether it will happen or not remains to be seen. Uh, we have, of course, uh, the Lonely Brits. Um, you know, do we cross the channel or do we not? Um, to what extent? Do we protect our colonial possessions? One interesting thing one interesting thing is that uh, the sur uh, surrender cities in Egypt are for uh, Great Britain. And in fact, I think this is the rule. If all the surrender cities in Great Britain are captured, uh, uh, Great Britain will capitulate, which makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, so basically the game goes until one side resigns or to the end of turn 19 and then basically you add up the war aims. And the war aims are more or less based along historical lines, like are the Germans in Paris? Um, what's happening with Great Britain's colonial possessions? Are the Russians uh, still around? Did the Reds kick them out? Um, what happened between Italy and Austria-Hungary? Is Austria-Hungary still a thing? Um, what's going on in the Balkans? So basically each side has war aims, um, and they're pretty, there's not a ton of surprises there, but in any case, it encourages you to play along historical lines, but with the number of events there are that are modeled, it doesn't necessarily have to flow along historical lines. So, uh, it's very interesting. I'm going to take a look, or I'll, I'm going to get started, and um, I don't know if I'll do a turn-by-turn, -turn, at least for the physical copy. I mean, I might, when the Vassal comes out, uh, in six months or so. Um, I know Compass delays those. Uh, so of course, support your physical releases, but it definitely makes it easier for me to play these games on Vassal. So, uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, this looks like another excellent production from Compass Games. They're on a bit of a tear recently, a lot of good ones coming out. So I hope you enjoyed this look at it. I went on a little bit longer than I meant to, but that's just who I am. Uh, anyway, my name is Mike, and I hope you enjoyed this look at Death in the Trenches by Compass Games. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next one.